We push open the doors to the Shadow Cursed Lands and officially begin Act 2. We aren't given long to take in the grim surroundings before a group of Harpers cross our path. They seem nice and a little bit scared, so, being the chaos-loving gremlin that we are, we decide to fucking jump scare them by misty-stepping into the middle of their group before introducing ourselves. Not eager to be outdone, the cursed shadows haunting these lands see our jump scare and raises a kidnapping. They take Harper Jonas off into the woods and change him into... something else, before attacking us and the Harpers. Fortunately, we have a lot of meat shield- I mean allies around. Though, the shadows are relentless and end up whittling our numbers down until we are the only one that remains. In honor of our fallen comrades, we finish the last of the shadows off and make our way to the last light in. A place with a very pretty aesthetic that is home to perhaps the dumbest character in the entire game. That, or she just hates living. Seriously. I love Isabel as a character, but on a scale of how much you want to be alive, with a 0 being Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, and a 10 being Kanye West, I can't put Isabel higher than a 3. The chorus of voices in my head urging me to let her die were drowned out by my lust for the potent robe, an item that lets you add your charisma to the damage of your cantrips, and yes, it stacks with Agonizing Blast. Unfortunately, you can only get it from Alfira, one of the current tenants of The Last Light Inn. If Isabel dies, Alfira dies, and so do our only chances of doing decent DPR for the rest of this run, so it's time to put on our best white knight helmet and see if we can't keep her alive. The big bad of this encounter is True Soul Marcus, a winged abomination with enough levels in fighter to be a serious threat, and he's certainly not alone. He brings with him a pack of pissed off bat people the game calls winged horrors who can paralyze you, or more likely, Isabel, with a single claw attack. Fortunately for us, Marcus not only has the levels of a fighter, but also the intelligence of one. Rather than beelining straight for his target, he decides to fly away and start beating the shit out of some random paralyzed harper. We take the wins we can get around here, and that is definitely one of them. We hunker down in the main room and protect Isabel from the oncoming winged horrors with the Hunger of Hadar spell and the Repelling Blast invocation coming in clutch, and both of us make it out of the fight relatively unscathed. The same can't be said for a few of our meat shield, I mean allies, as True Soul Marcus went on quite a tear while we were protecting Isabel from the winged horrors. Their sacrifice was not in vain though, as they saved the rest of the inn and, more importantly, put us one step closer to the potent robe. Unfortunately, before Alfir is willing to part with it, we need to rescue the captive tieflings from Moonrise Towers, and in order to do that, we need to get to Moonrise Towers. Easier said than done, considering it lies in the heart of the Shadow Cursed Lands, so we team up with a group of Harpers going on an expedition to find a remedy to the Shadow Curse. What we find instead is a half-drow, half-spider abomination known as a Drider, hopped up on what I can only imagine is a cocktail of hallucinatory narcotics and motor oil. A kinder man than me might tell you they tried to negotiate with the creature, but I'm personally of the mind that if you see something with more eyes than the word indivisibility, the only correct response is to send it to God as quickly as possible. Which in our case ends up being not very quickly at all. He has over 200 hit points and access to the Sanctuary spell, which he casts on himself seemingly every time he gets the chance, so taking him out is going to be a chore. And I do say chore instead of challenge because he's a bit of an idiot. He manages to softlock himself in the basement within the first few turns, and we post up on the rooftop with two of our Harper allies and take turns peppering him to death with our choice of ranged attack. Upon his expiration, we learn the secret as to how the Absolute Cultists are able to travel through the Shadow Curse without succumbing to it. Ancient potent magics? The blessing of their god, perhaps? No, they just took a pixie and fucking shoved her into a garden lamp. We release the creature from its prison, not out of a misguided sense of altruism, but so we can immediately turn around and extort it for a better solution to the Shadow Curse, namely one that doesn't require us to walk around with a lantern in our hand. Free now to move among the shadows as we please, we make our way towards Moonrise Towers and the tieflings trapped below it. We arrive just in time to watch this pissant goblin solo the final boss of Act 2 twice in a row before getting her spine rearranged. After our warm moonrise welcome, we make our way down to the dungeons where the tieflings are being held and begin to formulate a plan for their escape. The way I see it, we have two options. We can go in stealthily, scout the place out, accounting for how many enemies there are, and form a plan that helps us evade their line of sight while busting the tieflings out through the back. Or we could walk up to the first vaguely enemy-shaped figure we see and start putting holes in it until someone stops us. Hunger of Hadar comes through, and we soon find ourselves trading blows with the two guards nearest the doorway. 
Unfortunately for us, playing this game like a mindless idiot doesn't always yield good rewards. I really wish they would have given me some sort of warning about that. As it turns out, dungeons typically have a high volume of guards around, and the number of enemies we have to contend with keeps increasing turn over turn despite the respectable damage we're outputting. We hold our ground for as long as we can, but we're stuck in a seemingly never-ending war of attrition and eventually go down. Normally this means I'd cut this part out of the video, hit F8, and go again, but death in the Moonrise dungeons apparently doesn't mean game over. Instead, the guards that remain alive lock us up in one of the prison cells, and you'd think they'd be smart enough to not leave the spellcaster unattended, or to at least take away their magic items that let them cast Misty Step. We shove the warden off a cliff before learning we aren't the only ones in this dungeon planning to break the tieflings out. This gnome called Wolbrin, who seems like a normal guy and definitely not a massive prick, has a plan and we help put it into motion. It gets off to a rocky start, Get it. but pretty soon after it's smooth sailing. Get it. We reunite Alfira with her girlfriend, don't tell Damon, and she rewards us with the potent robe. This magnificent piece of outerwear gives us a bonus to our AC, grants us temporary hit points equal to our charisma modifier at the start of each of our turns, and most importantly, lets us add our charisma modifier to the damage our cantrips deal. And yes, that's per beam on Eldritch Blast, just like the Agonizing Blast Invocation. We are never taking this thing off. Now able to blast twice as charismatically as before, it's time to take on the three Thorms. First up is Garengoth, the Guardian of the Toll House. She has an ability that can one-hit us because it deals scaling damage based off the amount of gold that we're carrying, and by this point in the game, most characters are rocking anywhere from 4 to 5,000. Unfortunately for her, we have the ability to metagame, so we put all our gold in a chest before entering the Toll House and then kick her ass. The only other gimmick at play here is her hit points. She has over 600 of them, which would usually take us a long time to chew through, but you can deplete them by hundreds at a time by just taking out the skeletal minions that she has around the Toll House. Two Hunger of Hadar spells and a few Eldritch Blasts later, and we're back to committing tax fraud in peace. The next Thorum on the list is Thizabald, a rather rotund fellow keeping the bar down at the Waning Moon Tavern. He beseeches we join him for a night of storytelling and merriment, and, since our entertainer background gave us proficiency in the performance skill, and the resilient constitution feat gave us the same in constitution saving throws, we happily oblige. We make a rather splendid drinking buddy, and I wish I could say the same for Thizabald, but unfortunately he has a rather explosive personality Get it? that comes out when he has one too many. The final thorn we have to contend with is literally named Malice, and he resides in the House of Healing. Once a doctor of some sorts, now twisted by the Shadow Curse, he performs cruel experiments on living patients under the guise of giving them medical care. We get the drop on him and are faced immediately with a moral dilemma. In the middle of Malice and his undead nursing assistants, we find a still living patient. The dilemma, of course, being that they are so nicely grouped up for an AoE spell, but such a spell would almost surely kill the patient. It's at times like these that I like to consult the wiki. Ah, it seems this character has literally no purpose in this game other than being slain by Malice. A grisly fate I would wish upon no one, and from which I feel honor bound to save him. There you go my friend, you have now been slain by me. Malice and his gang of anti-nurses are fearsome opponents able to combo together to perform devastating attacks with a variety of different effects. Unfortunately for them, they suffer from one glaring weakness, and that is that not one of them has an effective ranged attack. They show some stubbornness towards the end, with Malice constantly resurrecting his dead assistants as a bonus action, but he doesn't have enough health points to keep that up forever, and none of them are able to pose any real threat to us thanks to the Hunger of Hadar spell locking them in place. With the last of the Thorms dealt with, it's time to move on to the Sharn Gauntlet. I know some of you were probably expecting us to raise the Shadow Curse, but we can't. Not that we don't have the skill to, but we literally can't. We murdered Halson for some reason. I swear, I don't remember doing this, I don't know why I did it, but I have the footage that proves I did in fact do it. I think my patron must be getting to me. We enter the Sharn Temple and a disembodied voice immediately tells us to leave. Joke's on you, buddy. The only voices I listen to are the ones inside my head. We go up to the puzzle door that I still don't know how to properly solve this many months after release, and somehow get it on the first try. 
From then, it's onto the floating Sharon Frisbee and down into the gauntlet proper. Not long into our Sharon expedition, we find a group of undead fighting a different group of undead while space-time breaks around them. We decide to leave the skeleton beef to the skeletons and focus our attention on closing the quantum ruptures. We finish our task not long after one of the groups of skeletons finishes theirs, and it seems they still have a bone to pick with us. Once we take the remaining skeletons out, we head through a previously locked door and meet the man behind the menace, a necromancer named Balthazar. He opens things up with a nice compliment, which we humbly disregard, and then he proceeds to call us a leech. Now, we don't take that kind of shit from anyone, least of all somebody who carves pentagrams into their face, for fuck's sake buddy, get a job. Our minds are already made up about kicking this guy's ass, but we decide to engage him in commerce briefly before doing so, mostly to purchase his haste potion. I could lie and say it's because I want it, but in reality I just would prefer he didn't have it. Once we make sure Balthazar isn't able to haste himself, we start the combat up, and I'll be honest, I was expecting an epic mage battle, but what I got was an awkward standoff featuring the world's most unfortunate ghoul. I wanted to play Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba here, but Content ID wouldn't let me, so instead you get to imagine the joke while you look at this picture of an elephant sucking its own dick. Is that still funny? In a last ditch effort to avenge his ghoul friend for the seventh time, Balthazar charges at us and attempts to cast Cloud Kill. Unfortunately for him, our patron has a bigger dick than his spellbook and our counterspell goes through. Being a leech has its advantages. Next up are the Sharn Trials. We sneak our way through the Soft Step Trial, Misty Step our way through the Faith Leap Trial, and then go take on a copy of ourselves in the same Self Trial. This fight gets a lot easier if you take all your gear off before entering it, so that's what we do. We get up to the top and basically one-hit ourselves. I don't know if I should be thrilled with the amount of damage we deal, or terrified at how little of it we can take. Either way, we're now the proud owner of three new Umbral Gems, and we're looking for a fourth. Let's go ask Gear Gear. We open up with the Hadar Classic on top of Gear Gear and his Maragon squad, and instead of engaging us in a typical fight, he opts to turn himself invisible. We can't blast him while he's invisible, and this makes both us and our patron very upset. To remedy the situation, we murder his pet cat and retreat to higher ground, forcing him to chase after us. Compelled, I'm sure, by some combination of devilish hubris and bloodlust-induced stupidity, he opts to turn himself invisible right after coating the entire ground he's standing on in explosive mines. Yeah, okay, buddy. I wonder where you went. We finish off the remainder of the Maragon soldiers and collect our prize, a fourth umbral gem. With all four gems in hand, we bust open the door to the Shadowfell and head inside to save Aelin. Merkel is bound to be a tough fight, so I really hope she's more useful than her girlfriend is in combat. As a reward for freeing her, we're given a glaive that we'll never use, and the privilege of watching one of my favorite cutscenes in this game. Before we head over to Moonrise and put an end to this thing, I wanted to give a quick tip for anybody who's struggling with the end of Act 2 on any difficulty. In the middle of the Shadow Curse lands, you can find this Sharan Altar, and if you head beneath it, you'll find three saving throw challenges linked with the three mental stats. If you pass them, you receive a plus five boon to their respective stat, which can be a hell of a buff for casters. Since we're only one character, we just take all three for ourselves. Believe it or not, our wisdom, intelligence, and charisma will all be relevant in the coming encounters, so it's a boon we're happy to take. With that bit of Sharon pre-buffing out of the way, we head over to Moonrise, where we find a squad of Harpers, led by our friend Jahira, already waiting to storm the gates. We discuss strategy with them for a moment, and Jahira seems like she's got this under control, so while they attack from the front, we decide to sneak around into the Absolute's kitchen and steal all their food. With the Absolute's pantries sufficiently plundered, we decide it's time to join the battle, and oh look, they were waiting for us. How kind of them. This fight goes the distance. We misty step up into the rafters to give ourselves the high ground bonus and keep out of reach of the pesky paladins who seem determined to spend every single spell slot they have before dying. 
Jahira dives straight for the enemy casters and front lines like an absolute beast before eventually going down. The Harpers even put in some work, coordinating their weapon attacks to take down some of the meteor targets on the opposing side, and, I'll be honest, absorbing quite a few hits that would have been fatal had they landed against us. Thanks boys, your courage will not be forgotten. When the dust settles, it's just us and two friendly Harpers standing above a valley of corpses. Wait, guys, what are you doing? Please, you saw what I did in there! Okay, whatever, see ya. I got more important things to do than worry about why you just aggroed on me. At the top of said list of importance is Catherick Thorm. We head up to the roof of Moonrise Towers and prepare to face him down with Dame Aelin at our side. Show us what you got, Aelin. Are you fucking serious? Aren't you a demigod? How are you getting tossed around by this guy? Whatever. When divinity fails us, we turn to eldritch madness. Hadar, bail me out. We take out the fireball happy mage first, with a very clutch psionic backlash before turning our attention to the necromites and finally Catherick himself. For all his offensive output, he doesn't have much in the way of movement and utility, so it's easy enough to keep him trapped in hunger of Hadar while we burn down his HP enough to make him retreat to the colony below. We're quick to follow and take some time to free Zevlor and the other captives from their incubation pods. We tank a shitload of mind blasts in the ensuing fight, which makes me thankful for our char and buff to intelligence. Once the squids are dealt with, we do a quick check out of curiosity to see if Mizora spawns in when Will's not in the party. She doesn't. And then we realize it's time to stop stalling and face the fight that I've been dreading since I started this run. Merkel. Well, technically you've got to fight Catherick first, but he goes down like a bitch in four rounds, so nothing to worry about there. When the big man himself shows up, we're already on the back foot. We used our action this turn to put Catherick down, so we're not going to have it until he gets his full turn. Which he uses to absolutely wallop Aelin. We take advantage of the distraction and get ourselves in position to cast Perilous Stakes, an illithid power that makes him vulnerable to all damage for the next three turns. We then use a Misty Step scroll to get the hell out of dodge before he starts swinging that scythe around. When our next turn comes around, we throw a Haste Spore Grenade at the ground to give ourselves a reliable second action every turn and cast the Wall of Fire spell underneath Merkel. We angle it so that it not only damages him, but also cuts off the entryway that his Necromites will take once they start trying to sacrifice themselves to heal him. From here, it's a race against the clock. We need to put enough damage into him before one of his Necromites passes their dexterity save against our Wall of Fire and is able to sacrifice themselves to him. This will heal him, but more importantly it'll give him a free casting of the spell Finger of Death, which basically one hits us, so we can't have that. One of them manages to slip through, but he's only got 100 hit points left, so we pop a Haste Potion and hope for the best. All we need is some lucky dice rolls, and there's a decent chance we can take him out with Call the Weak. First blast goes off and we land a crit, which is great. It all comes down to this, boys. Fuck. Well, here comes Finger of Death. If only there was something we could do. Nice. Catherick shows back up and comically eats our wall of fire for like 10 seconds while monologuing about how he failed his god or something. I don't know, man, if you've got that much HP left, I don't think this fight's over. Regardless, his monologue is cut short by Dame Aelin waking up and swooping in for perhaps Yoink. the most undeserved kill steal I've ever seen in my life. Catherick's loot is pretty decent, his armor unfortunately is heavy armor which we'll never use, but his shield gives us a decent upgrade to the adamantine one that we've been using, and his netherstone is of course necessary to finish the game. Our guardian shows up to tell us just how important it is and emphasize that dying is bad. Oh fuck, what would I do without you? And with that, we reunite everyone's favorite moon lesbians and hit the road to Act 3. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.